On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward. Best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. All right, all right, everybody. I am Jack Murphy. This is the Jack Murphy Live Show, and you are back, and we are live. And today, I have a very special guest, somebody that I have been looking forward to speaking with for some time. We have got Blake Masters here, the let's see, the president of the Teal Foundation, CEO of Teal Capital, and a Senate candidate from Arizona. How you doing this morning, Blake? Doing great, Jack. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Yeah, it's my pleasure. You know, I just talked to J.D. Vance, who's in the same yep. universe, local, even family, maybe, political family as you are. And uh, I want to start off by asking you the same question I asked him, and it's going to lead into a discussion on immigration. Uh, I feel, and by the way, guys, we're just jumping right into it. If you don't know who Blake is, look him up. There's a lot out there. <laughs> uh in the last 30 or 40 years, I feel like one of the main questions that we've had in front of us that we have failed to address is who is an American? What does it mean to be an American? In the revolutionary times and the Federalist Papers, John Jay and the folks defined an American as people with a common history, culture, language, religion, blood, the ties of going through the struggles, the fighting of the wars, et cetera, et cetera, and have built a brotherhood over time seems as though that that perception has changed our immigration acts have opened up the doors whereas in 1790 it was very clear you had to be white uh today that is not one of the conditions i'm asking you sir especially someone in arizona especially somebody that has immigration as a large part of their platform what what is an american today who gets to be an american what is your vision of what an american citizen is and what it means I think these are the exact questions that Congress should be asking and doesn't, right? We have an immigration policy right now. It's just uh, open borders and we see how that, well that works out. We also take a million legal immigrants every year. Some of them become naturalized, but you get the sense that in Congress, there's no debate about like how many people should we bring in every year legally? Who should they be? What skills should they have? Um, what characteristics do we want in new Americans? This stuff is almost third rail. Like you're almost not allowed to talk about it. And I think that's really messed up. I agree with so much of the founder's definition that you just said. Um, obviously, you know, uh, after Civil War, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments and all that, we got rid of, of the, the racial conception of American citizenship, which, which is great, right? Good riddance. Um, but the, the question is, can we be a cohesive people? Are we still allowed to say, no, Americans are a people? Um, and and it's, it has to do with our ideals, certainly, but America is not just an ideal. It's not just an idea. You know, there, there can't be 7 billion Americans just because 7 billion people read the Declaration of Independence. So there is something to us being an actual, cohesive, coherent people. There's a cultural element. There's a blood element. Obviously, if your parents are citizens, you get to be a citizen. Um, and I think that's good. But I think this is just an open question. And the left wants to make it so open that it's not a question at all. They want to say there's nothing special about being American. Uh, versus some other global citizen. And I think, no, there still is, and it might be messy, and we got to figure it out. But it's someone who understands that this is the greatest country in the world. It's someone who comes here legally and follows the rules. And it's someone who agrees, even though we're going to be all different people, people are going to disagree, it's someone who agrees to be bound by some baseline um, of, of cohesive cultural uh, standards. And I just, I see sort of open borders, left-wing globalism. I see that as more or less intentionally um, just ripping that sort of shared notion of identity apart. Yeah, the globalized nature uh, and the globalist vision is one of homogenization. It's one of destroying the barriers, destroying our selective ability to decide what passes through your barriers, uh, which is ironic given the fact that the very first reaction to the uh, corona was social distancing, right? So like there's actually a notion of erecting barriers to protect yourself uh, that we're living out uh, on a daily basis. But when it comes to immigration, uh, it seems that the left doesn't even want to ask a simple question of like, who is an American? So would you agree with the statement that simply wanting a better life is not sufficient enough uh, uh, of a condition to be an American? Is that because I think that that's what uh, that's what the left would say is as long as you want a better life, you're welcome in America. Yeah, that's insane. 
That makes no sense. Okay. Obviously, like a billion people would want to come here if, if uh, right? and we see the problems with Hashem that just more or less invites people to to break the law at great risk to themselves, right? A, a, a cartel to be trafficked over. No, it's crazy. Obviously, like we want people who buy into the American system, but it doesn't mean everybody who wishes to be an American should be. That's just never what uh, our immigration system is supposed to be about. Now, I'm going to assume that your position on Ill illegal immigration is zero, as would be anybody's. That is the uh, correct number of, that, yes. That is the correct number of illegal immigrants. What is the correct number of legal immigrants, and what is the criteria by which we should choose who gets in? Again, I think Congress should have a debate about this. Certainly, I have my voice at the table when I'm in. Um, right now, we take over a million legal immigrants every year. I think that's too many, given that so many of our own already existing citizens are struggling. Um, you know, I've seen firsthand in Silicon Valley, the H-1B visa system is completely abused. At this point, it's like a corporate handout for Google and Facebook. And we took all of this, you know, productive manufacturing capacity. We shipped it to Southeast Asia and it was like, sorry, your job's going overseas. You know, you can, you can just learn to code. And then it's like, no, actually you can't learn to code because we're going to take 80,000 people from India every year, import them on H-1B visas, and they're going to get those coding jobs for less money. Um, and so, look, I want a certain amount of immigration, um, but but maybe just the best and the brightest, maybe like the 50,000, you know, top rocket scientists and nuclear engineers. And like, we ought to be able to say you can come to this country if your presence here is going to on net uh, improve the life and, and the country for the average American citizen. That is the litmus test for good immigration policy. I suspect the correct number closer to 50,000 or 100,000 a year rather than a million. And until such time as we can figure out, like, how do we actually get a sane immigration system? Um, we should just be looking to restrict it radically. Very good. You gave me a number. I thought I was going to have to ask a follow up on that, but I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, you said that uh, you'll have your voice at the table. Uh, for a second, I thought we weren't going to know what that voice was until you got to the table. So thank you very much for saying that. Uh, I can hear some of the guys uh, in my network saying, drill down, drill down. And we did. So there we go. That's a good one. Uh, I'm going to shift just a little bit here. Uh, it's my understanding that you were on the transition team for Trump. Is that right? That's right. Okay. So one of the biggest criticisms that can be very fairly levied at the Trump administration is that they failed to staff up. They failed to place enough people in enough important positions in order to uh, effectively conduct the policy that the president had in mind. Uh, we did get some people in the right places. Trump fired them or they resigned or whatever, a couple places. But generally speaking, you know, what, what do you think the main issue was in terms of finding the right number of people to work in government for Trump to advance the Trump policy and Trump agenda? And if there is a problem, which it seems to me there was, what can we do differently? What would you do differently? What would we advocate for publicly? What do we do behind the scenes in a, in a, in a conservative environment to try to facilitate or grow more of these types of folks? What was the main issue in your experience and how do we solve that problem moving forward? This reserve bench, I think, is the real problem. Right. No, you need a bench. You need a cadre. You need um, sort of a, at least a couple hundred, probably more like two. There's 2,000 presidential appointees, I think. So you've got to be ready to go on day one with those 2,000 or who, who are they? And do you have the 200 people that can help you pick those 2,000? Um, what I saw during the Trump transition was a, a lot of chaos. You know, I'm used to sort of seeing early stage chaos. I, I you know, my background's in startups. And every startup from the inside, you know, can look really messy. Um, certainly the ones that fail do, but even the ones that succeed look really messy under the hood. And so it was a fascinating environment to be in, but I, I think it was just politics. It's like, in Trump Tower on the 14th floor between Election Day and Inauguration Day, there were an awful lot of people who um, who had immediately surrounded, they'd flocked there because that was the new center of power. And they weren't necessarily friends to then candidate Trump when when the president was running for office. They weren't part of this America First agenda. And so you had the Reince Priebus faction, the Chris Christie faction, the Pence faction, and these sort of overlapped, but they were also different power centers. And everybody was sort of jostling for power. Um, and then I think you had the more, you know, Trump 2016 campaign, America first faction, but nobody really showed up on day one saying like, we, you know, we have these dozen people 
and they're going to lead us to these dozen people and we know what we're doing. I think it caught the victory, frankly, caught a lot of people by surprise. And um, because of that, there was a power vacuum. And I think that more GOP establishment forces kind of took over and it took a long time. For, for instance, it was like really hard for people who worked on the campaign, on the Trump campaign and the early years to actually get jobs in the administration. Way to get a job in the administration on was to, uh, you know, Ted Cruz, Jeb Bush. And that's a problem. The, the thing, though, is this got figured out, like the, the people who came in to clean this up at the tail end of the Trump administration to run the PPO office. They were good. They were good. They were aligned with President Trump. They understood him. And so the staffing did get way better. It got way better. And that's the real crime of not having a, a second administration in office right now because the staffing would have been so good, it would have been so much better. And um, I think the thing to learn here is just show up on day one next time. Like now we know how to do it, right? If President Trump runs again, you know, I think he'll win. And now we know how to do it. If he chooses not to run, we hopefully get a good Republican in office instead of some rhino and we'll know how to do it. Um, we know the people, it, it, the, the left is really good at it, right? They have the binder. They know who's gonna be in the next two administrations already. We don't do this and there's something charming about that, but we need to do more of it and show up prepared next time. Yeah, so I met a, a Teal fellow this summer. Uh, she was very impressive. Uh, she started uh, multiple companies, very successful, extremely bright, well-educated, even though she didn't go to college. And you're it's the best way to be well educated. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, well, you know, I, I learned a lot in college. Mostly I learned about myself, to be honest. Uh, but yep. uh, she is a product of a social initiative and a business initiative as well uh, that addressed this need of like creating the new talent. This, you know, this may be off the subject a little bit, but like, do you have a similar vision maybe uh, for that, for like creating, creating new bench talent for the Republican Party? Yeah, I think so. And the, the problem is, you know, or it's this fundamental question, do you do it in D.C. or do you do it outside of D.C.? If you do it in D.C., maybe everybody's just a swamp creature. And, you know, I think this is a big problem, staffing Senate offices. One reason why I know I'll be a really good senator is I have a good knack for staffing. Um, most senators, even conservative senators, their median staff member is quite to the left of, of where they are. And that's a huge, huge problem because like, oh, shit, you need a comms director. Like someone, you know, hire this person. They used to work for Rubio. And it's like, well, everybody just kind of goes along to get along and you're always thinking about your career. And so even people who are genuinely quite conservative become moderate over time. And all of a sudden you've got like a pretty center right center uh, Senate office and it, you know, they can be worse. So there's something about the um, homogenizing influence of D.C. that I think makes it hard to build the sort of American first cadre within D.C. The other problem, though, is if you go outside of D.C., you know, if you just try to do it from Claremont or from you know, somewhere else, um, is it too abstract? Is it too theoretical? Do these people actually know, you know, the ins and outs of, of governance? And the answer is usually no. And so there's this huge tension here. I think it's some, some project to combine both. But this is, you know, I think this is what we're doing right now. This is the, this is the environment we're in. It's, it's can we figure out how to rebuild the Republican Party in this America first direction? And it's an open question. I'm optimistic, but it is an open question. It is indeed. The talent pool needs to be broader and deeper. Do you have a staff, like a staff in mind? Are you going to get placed with a bunch of people in DC that are going to drag you to the left or do you have a staff ready to bring with you? No, I've got, uh, I, I, I think I know the right people. This is one benefit of, you know, I've been running Peter Thiel's uh, investment office for a while now. We try to uh, invest in startups and make a lot of money and that's all great, but he's very political and I've gotten to be very political over the last few years, sort of behind the scenes. And so I feel like I know um, who, who are young, young, talented, hungry people on the so-called new right. And people disagree with each other, right? And, and there's a lot of intellectual diversity on the right. This is something that the left doesn't have to deal with. Um, I think it's a blessing and a curse, but it is where we are. Um, I, I just know so many of these people. And um, suffice it to say, they're not people who would get staffed in traditional Senate offices, which is why I know my office will be like super effective. So I know the people I want in my office, but again, to staff a presidential administration, if we fast forward to Trump 2024, or if he doesn't run someone else, you know, we need 2000 people, we need them ready to go. And they can't be George W. Bush Republicans. That doesn't work anymore. I got to ask, uh, what's it like hanging out with Peter and Eric Weinstein at the same time? I mean, you guys sit around and debate things. Cause I've been following Eric 
uh, for a long time. And he follows me too. We've been following each other for years and I've been watching his, this is, this is off my script, but I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've been watching him for years and seeing the evolution and then discussion. And I've seen Peter speak and listen to you. And, and I just wonder, you know, what well, just any stories come to mind? I mean, just anything you could share with us and the three of you guys hashing things out and, and how are you going to get Eric across the finish line? <laughs> yeah. Well, he should come on your show. I I've asked him. You could, hey, if you know him, put it in a good word, would you? <laughs> Eric Weinstein, come on this show. Awesome, um, let's do it. He'd be, he'd be good. I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's wild. They're, they're, they're obviously both extremely smart. I have this running thing with Eric, where like Eric's obviously not a Democrat. He's obviously not of the left or from the left. Um, although it's very important to his presentation that he. He, he be that that's his thing i didn't leave the left the left left me you know and right. it's like, fine dude but like you're talking about all these sort of right-wing ideas and you're certainly friendly about it and yeah i mean he is he is different and he does come from some some different place but he's he's very smart i just think um it's like come on over to our side man just like Let's register republican try to get the right people elected the progressives they hate him you know he's he's anathema to them they don't like anybody who departs from the party line, he points this out, but then tries to, tries to be centrist. So I make fun of him for that. Um, he, he just says, you know, I'm some crazy far right Republican or something. So we hash it out, but he is very interesting. And the thing I like about him and, and Peter, um, you know, there's not two guys in the world that are, that are like those guys. They're just very unique. I know a lot of smart people, um, but it's, it's entirely possible to be smart and conventional. Right. And, and it's like and, most of my peers at Stanford Law School, extremely smart, extremely conventional. And now they're like undersecretaries of whatever at the Department of Transportation. Congratulations. You know, it doesn't right. really move the dial. Um, but I think right. Peter, obviously, with his business career, I mean, he's, he's a world. And Eric, I think, has just um, sort of exploded on the scene in the last few years because he's willing to uh, analyze things in ways that no one else is. He's willing to any Sometimes I think that misfires, you know, but like you got to have uh, some guts to get out there and coin new words and pretend that you're Shakespeare. And, you know, but like some of the times like embedded growth obligations, it's something I use a lot. I think Eric literally didn't make up the concept, but he like identified it, coined this term for it and actually has a lot of explanatory power in terms of like why our institutions don't work and, you know, what the, the sort of cliff we're heading to. So I think he's like smart and brilliant. And obviously when you get smart and brilliant people together, it's uh you know, grab the popcorn. It's really fun to watch. Smart and conventional is probably the scariest thing that we could face right now because Thanks the for- party line and taking the, you know, everything at face value and just pushing the uh, regime growth uh, is, is uh, tough when, you know, it's a smart person just executing on that. We need people to be smart right. and risk takers and smart and think outside of the box. Uh, one of the biggest issues that you're talking about is big tech. You've talked about breaking up big tech. Uh, I've interviewed Matt Stoller on this show. He's a Democrat. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but if you are, uh, nope. if you're not, you should reach out. Uh, he is, uh, you know, very antitrust. His book Goliath was fantastic in documenting the way antitrust is, has grown and evolved over time in the United States. Uh, I remember earlier people talking you know, claims of like, break up big tech, break up big tech. And the people on the left would call them MAGA socialists and like wanting to use the government to do all this stuff for the people. Uh, I would like to know exactly what it means to break up big tech. And I don't mean broad sweeping generalizations. I mean, specifics. Like when you say break up big tech, what exactly precisely do you mean and how do you go about accomplishing it and for what end? Sure. I'll start by saying I think uh, the, the easier thing to do before breaking up big tech is to just make these communications platforms common carriers. We already know how to do that. It's what the phone company is, right? At a certain point, call it a couple hundred uh, billion dollars in market cap and a couple hundred million users. And congratulations, you are a um, common carrier. So that, I think, solves a lot of the censorship problem. I do well, think before, we should probably before go, we go past that, is yeah. that would not put a chilling effect on innovation, knowing that if you get too big, all of a sudden you're going to get taken over no, by these new regulations? I don't think so. I don't think so. I, if you put the ceiling too low and you say, like, if you're a startup with 100 users, like, obviously that changes it. But I think, uh, no, if you if you're a communications tool and you're worth, you know, X dollars, and especially if you're a public company and you've got 100 million users, 
if you become certain, you know, you tighten that up and study exactly what the definition should be. But basically, uh, commonsensically, no, Facebook and Twitter, they're of a certain scale where you can afford to treat them differently than like a hair salon or a tiny startup. And I just don't, I just don't buy the argument that like, oh, you can't ever possibly regulate anything, no matter how big it is, because that'll stifle entrepreneurship. It's just, I just don't buy it. And I think like 80% of people know that that that's, that's purely a theoretical objection. So no, treat Facebook and treat Twitter as common carriers. We know I don't how mean, to do that. I it's don't mean big. to drill to, to be too much of a stickler on this, but as someone that invests in venture startups, you're going to look at your startup founders and be like, we're going to give you this money, but we know it's purely theoretical exercise that you might ever reach 100 million users. So don't worry about it. Is that is that literally what you're going to tell guys when you we'll give say, them money? no, here's the money. Go build an awesome business. I want you to build an awesome, successful, fantastic business. And if you become as powerful as Google or Facebook or Twitter, <laughs> be prepared to be treated differently than our Series A or Series B companies. Like, come on, these companies have more power than most governments. And, you know, they're not even like at the, at this, at this scale, they're, they're not even private. You know, people say like, Blake, who are you to tell Facebook how big it can be? It's a private company. Go build your own Facebook. And it's like, it's not a private company because it works closely with the White House and it takes direction from Jen Psaki about like what information to pull off the platform. We wouldn't want to spread any COVID information, right? And I think the, the Dems now use that FTC antitrust hammer, the threat of it to sort of uh, bludgeon Facebook into compliance, you know, and that starts to look a lot more like corporate fascism or sort of technocratic oligarchy than any sort of pure free market. So no, I think uh, Republicans have to be willing, you shouldn't just use state power indiscriminately. Um, you should do it wisely, but we have to be willing to use state power um, to sort of rein in these companies. Otherwise, they're just gonna have their way with us. All right, so first step is is, is declaring them common carriers. What's, what's after that? I think we should explore using antitrust to break face, for instance. I don't think Facebook should be able to have what's uh, app and Instagram and then Facebook Classic all these different products and then they just mine all the data from users and roll it up into sort of one central shared repository um, and then they can turn around and use that to serve incredibly effective i think basically predatory targeted advertising to people it's just unclear why you would allow something so big such a behemoth to own all of these separate businesses instagram could operate basically just as effectively from a consumer usage perspective as a standalone business and so why would we just let all of this corporate consolidation um, continue to exist? And, you know, Google's bought one company every year or sorry, every week for the last 10 years. And they do it not because they're so excited about this new startup technology that they want to integrate in their platforms. They do it to stifle competition. Most of the time they just buy the talent, squash the technology. They're in the business of um, I'm just buying companies to to make sure that they can stay big and entrench their own power. And at a certain point, I don't think you can allow that. So you're, you're in the Senate, you're, you're there. It's you've, you've won. Well, what do you, what, what are the concrete steps that, that you do? I mean, you, 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 you common carrier, but, but after that, like, where are we going with that? You're going to file, well, you're going to file antitrust. You're going to push the FTC to, to, to I think uh, you do a huge review of the, uh, the current rather. antitrust laws on the books. Yeah. Just review the antitrust laws in the books. And I actually think, it's very possible that they might not neatly apply to Facebook, to Google, right? Because these laws were written a long time ago for a very different context. We were worried about price gouging. So if you build the telegraph or the railroad, right, you have a natural monopoly. Um, no one else is going to come do that again in that same uh, geographical location. And so why, you know, wouldn't you just jack the prices up? And that's really bad for consumers. But the laws that take care of that sort of define the consumer harm as a higher price. And that doesn't really neatly map onto Facebook, right? Because you, do, you don't pay to use Facebook's product. It's free. You don't pay to use the product because you are the product. And so that's very interesting. And if you just stick to the old definitions of consumer harm, then sort of by definition, Facebook's not harming anyone at all. You know, it's free. How could it? It's free and people are volunteering to use it. So where's the harm? But I don't, I don't think people really have a, a good understanding of how much data Facebook is collecting about them or how much Google knows about them. And so I think we need um, I think we need a whole new suite of laws. We need to update the antitrust laws to sort of deal with modern networked monopoly internet companies. And we just need a whole new suite of data privacy laws. You know, that, that it doesn't look like the European version, which I think is ham-handed, but I think the spirit of that is right. Like people should be in charge of their own data. 
And it's, it's really hard right now because um, you have a Congress that either is ideologically unwilling to do that or the people that want to do that don't necessarily know how to do it. Because I think the Senate, for instance, is very old and people are not exactly tech savvy. Um, and then I don't think the Democrats care at all. I think the Democrats want these companies to get super big. And again, they love that fusion of, of corporate and state power because they think it'll benefit them. Yeah. So I just see uh, hundreds of millions of Americans using these products every day, basically giving up, I think unwittingly, all this data and it's just being used against them. And then the companies use the monopoly profits from that hyper-effective advertising to then put their thumb on the scale in our, our elections. And so I just see that as a huge threat. If we don't do something about that, I think in five or 10 years, we're in a really dark place. Yeah. So uh, for people that may not understand the full depths of this, this topic, like, for example, your children, when they go to school, participate in, in data management systems and testing systems that the textbook companies then use their personal children's information and results. Then they use that information to create new textbook products and new curricula. Why is your children's test scores and their data being used to make money for giant corporations without any remuneration back to the child? Uh, my friend, John Robb, who you may know, uh, is a technologist and a strategist and an analyst, and he understands this. And he's proposed an Internet Bill of Rights. He's proposed uh, figuring out ways to make it so that you own your data from the very beginning uh, and can, and we can conduct microtransactions and you can pay you can pay the children for helping this corporation make money off of their back. And uh, it's something that's really important. And as you said, we don't have much there's not a long time to figure this out uh, because the way that the system works, I think is it's almost going to be a shut door eventually if we don't crack down on this. But I want to drill back down on one thing you said, which was you want to change the laws. Congratulations. Kudos to you as a, as a candidate for the legislature suggesting that we actually legislate and we have open debate on the floor of the Congress. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to me, this is one of the biggest criticisms that we have of the republic in general today is that the legislature is not legislating and that it, and they've put this off to the administrative state. The administrative state makes a ruling. Someone doesn't like it. That goes before the court. Court decides basically now the court, the judiciary and the administrative state are legislating. We've seen in the 18 months of Corona, no, no open debate on the floor of Congress about mandates or this or that. How would you bring the spirit of legislation back to the legislature? Sounds like a dumb question. But truly, though, it's not a dumb we... question. That's that's hard. Yeah. It's, so how do we hard. do that? And I think I think you do it by trying. Like I, you know, um, I remember in law school reading about Chevron deference and, you know, the sort of court case that kind of cemented the, the, um, the court's willingness to tolerate this huge delegation of power from Congress to the administrative agencies. And it is it's crazy. It's like we've created a fourth branch of government, even worse, because it's unaccountable unelected rights unconstitutional it's 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 really crazy and so i i look at congress and i see uh, a legislative body that's kind of unwilling to do its job and now that's becoming the new normal so i hate it and um yeah maybe as one senator i can't like immediately change that but i think i can um i think i can make a lot of noise i think i can make it uncomfortable um you know my my attitude is i'll go in i'll introduce bills i'll vote the right way um but yeah, one senator can't pass legislation. Fine. Well, I will shine the flashlight on, you know, the system and the people who are preventing, you know, this bill from getting a hearing, who are preventing this debate from happening. I think most people, when they go in, you become temperamentally conservative. You don't want to ruffle feathers. You don't want to rock the boat. And, and you know, because I think all the senators want to be president and the way to be president is to look very presidential and like just go along to get along until it's your turn or something like that. And I think it's complete crap. Um, I want to go in and, and change things. I want to take the proverbial machete in and start clearing out brush because we're drowning in literacy. We're drowning in processes that no longer work. And I think it's only exciting to get like DC sucks, you know, being a Senator, you're under the microscope. Um, it's sort of hellish on your family. Like it's not fun. Like I guarantee you my job right now is fun. You know, running Peter Thiel's family office, like people would kill for that job. Um, it's great. And I just, I feel like it's really important to get in and actually, ruffle feathers and change things. And so how much can one person do? Like, I don't know, but I intend to find out. And I think, um, I think you get a few of us in there. Now you get a new, new caucus and you sort of change the, change the vibe, expand the Overton window, change what people are willing to talk about. Um, there's also a huge, uh, opportunity to just 
understand and ensure the um, sort of administrative details of the Senate, the procedure, the procedural rule. I think water is actually a lot more powerful than people think um, in terms of being able to, to force certain debates or block certain things. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I intend to just go in and raise, raise hell because we need people to do that. Otherwise, we're in big trouble. Who should be the Senate Majority Leader? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine Rand Paul as Senate Majority Leader? My gosh, it'd be, uh, it'd be amazing. Um, I don't know. Well, everybody wants to ask me, like, you know, um, I'll get in these Republican activist rooms and people say, like, Blake, will you commit, will you promise not to vote for Mitch McConnell for leader? And, of course, I get what they're, I get why they're asking that, right? And I'll give my answer in a second. But it's like everything that you do on the campaign trail is being recorded. Right. Everything is just waiting to get cut up into some five second spot. And so they're they, they mean well, but they're also asking me to declare war on Mitch McConnell so that he can send 20 million dollars into my primary opponent. You know, who's a very, I think, milquetoast, boring Republican who will lose the election. It's like that, that's not good for anybody. So what I say is um, I will only vote for a leader who's super serious about affecting uh, the Trump 2016 agenda, the America first agenda. Um, I'll interview. Anybody who's, you know, up for leadership and I will vote for the person who I think is going to put that agenda in place. So I think that's a fair answer. And I think it's <laughs> stupid to go out and, and start throwing bombs for hypotheticals. But I think people who spend one minute looking at my candidacy, they can see the vibe. They can see that I'm serious about changing things. I'm not just looking to go along to get along. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I understand your circumstance at the same time. Uh, the people voting for you and supporting you want to know what you're going to do when you get there, which is why people ask. We ask about your agenda. Your legislative agenda is just as important uh, as your parliamentarian agenda once you get into that uh, that body. Uh, so I think it's a valid question, and I appreciate the— uh, Totally valid question. I think we need new leadership. I do. That's, like, why I'm running, you know, yeah. and I will only vote for leadership in the Senate that I think is going to offer new substantive ideas, um, and it's going to play offense. I do think in the past, Mitch McConnell's been very good at judges, right? That's important. It's not everything. He's been very good at blocking Democrats. That's important. That's not everything. We need to play offense. And that's, I, frankly, I think a weak point, something I would discuss with him, right? But yeah. um, if I, you know, I mean, Rand Paul, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of good, a lot of good uh, potentials. And I think we should be thinking about, like, what does the Republican Party look like, not just in 2022? not just in 2024, but like, what kind of party are we trying to build? What kind of leadership do we want by 2030? Because there's going to be a whole generational changing of the guard. You know, one thing that I haven't heard on the campaign trail is like, Blake, aren't you young to run for, for Senate? I'm 35. And, you know, I just haven't heard that. I think that's very interesting. I expected to hear a lot more of that, but it's actually the, the more older crowd. Two thirds of my voters in the Republican primary in Arizona are over the age of 55. Probably one third is over the age of 65. And so it's these people who, you know, who are peers with McConnell and, uh, and Schumer and Pelosi. It's those people who are like, can we finally get a young guy in office? Because all the same baby boomer type politicians, they just say the same stuff. They sound the same. They do the same. And it's led us to this point where I think we're about to lose the country. So I think people are open for a lot of change. And Republicans should be thinking about what kind of party we want to build in the next decade, not just the next two years. I was just sitting here thinking, uh, man. I'm old enough now that a guy running for Senate is 10 years younger than me. Holy crap. When did that happen? I still remember when Major League Baseball players seemed like they were the oldest people possible. And here I am now. It's wild. Yeah. It is now wild. Now they're like 23. Wow. What happened? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you mentioned the 2016 Trump uh, admin, uh, Trump agenda. What, uh, what part of the 2016 Trump agenda do you think uh, was left unaccomplished? And uh, what part of it do you want to pick up and, and carry forward? You know, I mean, I'd, I'd say the three big pillars are sort of uh, immigration, less immigration. There's sort of law and order component, right? So build the wall, immigration, law and order at the border. Um, two is sort of a healthy working class, middle class, pro-family economy. Uh, three, I would say, is just um, a restrained, sensible foreign policy, right? Stop the overseas adventures. Don't look to get in a ground war in Syria and all that. And I think the Trump administration was like pretty successful on all three points. Um, the, the criticism would just be, I wish we got even more done, right? I wish the wall was fully complete. I wish the border, uh, you know, I think it was very stable in December of 2020. And we've seen how bad it's gotten since. So by definition, the sort of Trump policies were working well. But this is a problem 
when we can't pass legislation, when we only sort of do things via executive order, it makes it very easy for the, the next you know, Biden-Harris regime to come in power and just reverse stuff. And they reverse stuff right away. So our gains were lost. So immigration, a lot of progress, just limited. Same thing with the economy. Um, you know, before COVID, it's easy to forget. I think the Trump economy was sort of an economic miracle that was happening. Like wages in this country, median wages had been stagnant from the early 1970s all the way to 2016. And finally, under President those policies, um, you know, t tariffs on China, uh, lower taxes, deregulation, the stuff was actually working and people's wages strike. I think that's great. Now all of that is gone and the government's just printing money and, um, you know, it's sort of back to the status quo ante with China. Like that was working and it's just, it, you know, wasn't enough. I wish it was more. I wish Trump was still in office, but, um, but we got to get in power and sort of re-implement those policies and keep that going. Because if you get that kind of that kind of stuff going and it's not just interrupted every four years by a horrible democrat regime and i think we can we can actually start to build a healthier economy same thing with the uh foreign policy you know it's um great on this and he doesn't get a lot of credit um he he drew down in afghanistan right it was biden who, who ultimately pulled the plug and they did it in the most incompetent way imaginable but i think trump knew we shouldn't be fighting forever winless wars you know and and it was tough because Trump had the right instincts here. Remember when he just sort of uh, struck Soleimani? He was willing to punch a bully in the nose and use force. But unlike John Bolton, you know, who wanted to go to war in Iran every five minutes, and unlike all the generals that wanted Trump to get like on the ground in Syria, he just, his instincts were better than that. He just knew that we shouldn't be doing that stuff. So I think the foreign policy reset that we, uh, we accomplished under Trump was huge. Just the way he reset the conversation on China was huge. But again, the criticism would just be, it was, uh, it was too brief. It was interrupted. It was sort of plagued internally by staffing issues, which we've discussed. So it just needs, just needs more and better. But I think he actually made meaningful progress on like each of those campaign pledges. In your introductory video, you say that your dream is for America, for families to be able to support themselves on one income. Boy, there is a lot that would have to happen for that to be the case. What Yep. makes what about your candidacy what about your actions will make that more than just a marketing pitch how do we actually affect that in reality yeah i mean i think there's an immigration component you know bernie sanders used to be able to talk about this on the left one of the worst things about illegal immigration is how it depresses wages for lower class and working class americans it's like literally just unfair. He used to be able to talk about that 10 years ago. Now you can't talk about that again, because I think even the left has lost this conception of differentiating between an American citizen who the government ought to look out for and sort of a global citizen. They conflate those two. And I think the old left, you know, maybe to an Eric Weinsteinian type of point, the old left used to say, no, like we should take care of our own workers. And I think that's what the new right is, is more interested in. Um, picking up that that torch and running with it. So I think, look, you stop the glut of illegal immigration. Um, you also stop like H-1B visa abuse. You basically say the best asset, the best asset that American workers have is monopolistic access to their own American labor markets. We should have tight labor markets. We should be training our own people to do the jobs of the future. Yeah, you may need to like import a few brilliant rocket scientists, you know, from India or Switzerland or whatever. Um, but we can't just stop looking at the whole rest of the world as people to come and, you know, take jobs because they've already been trained to do it. And we're unwilling to train our, our teenage human capital. You know, we're just going to give them Netflix and tell them they can go be yoga instructors or something like that doesn't work. And so I think there's a huge immigration component. I think most Republican politicians want to stay away from it, you know, cause they're worried about being called racist or whatever. And I'm not. I'm not worried about being called that. I'm just trying to do the right thing. And we need to tighten up labor markets. Immigration is a huge piece of that. I also think we need to stop offshoring, right? And actually focus on how to re-onshore all this industrial capacity we've lost. The COVID pandemic and the sort of crazy lockdowns resulting from it showed us how weak our supply chains are. Like it is crazy that Ford can't produce trucks, like literally can't produce trucks and used cars just going through the roof um because of the chip shortage right and it was a decision a policy decision to take all of this industrial capacity it was silicon valley so named because like that's where we invented this stuff 
And then to save a buck, you know, we shipped all that stuff mostly to Southeast Asia, um, which is crazy. And then there's also national security implication, right? Like half the computer chips are made in Taiwan and China looks at this like horrible administration. They see uh, abject incompetence with how we withdrew from Afghanistan. So of course they're salivating over Taiwan and why would they not move right now to take it? And of course, as soon as they do that, then the chip shortage really becomes bad. So I think we need to be, uh, you know, putting putting silicon manufacturing capacity back in the United States. It's good for national security. It's good for the people who can actually work those high tech jobs. It's good for the infrastructure that gets built up around that. And I think there's a way to do it. It's like still pretty pro market. You know, no one is talking about a command and control economy. No one's talking about socialism or something like that. It's just saying maybe sort of unthinking global free trade doesn't necessarily end up in the best place. Maybe you get cheaper consumer products at the price of some hollowed out middle class. And maybe we should talk about that trade off. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it, you know, uh, in writing my book, Democrats of Deplorable, I drove all around in Pennsylvania, especially. And you just drive through these towns where there's just like literally just like the trees are overgrown and there's just like a giant factory and it's just rusted and sitting there empty and vacant. And uh, if you live in the cities and if you're on the coast and you don't get out and you don't see it, it's hard to believe, you know, the, the hollowed out nature. But then, then when you see it, it is, it's devastating. And of course we see a lot of the ramifications in that, in the opioid crisis and everything else. I want to push back a little bit though. I've also on my travels, have been all over the country in the last year and everywhere we go, it says want help wanted $18 an hour to work at McDonald's. We're paying $250 for an application. Uh, I know there's a lot of forces at work there. What do you make of that? It feels as though we have at once a decrease in uh, labor force participation. And at the same time, we also have increased pressure on wages going up. No one can hire who they want to hire. We've also had an influx of illegal immigrants. Uh, how do we square all of those things up to actually divine what's happening in the economy? Well, it's hard, but I do think one uh, commonsensical thing to do is to stop printing money to give it to people. Like that does destroy some sort of incentive to work. This is sort of not a new, this is not a new right talking point. This is just sort of classic Republicanism, but I do think there's something to that. Um, people will not, yeah, 18 bucks an hour is a lot to work at McDonald's, but people won't want to do that if, you know, their opportunity cost is is higher. And so they'll, they'll just do something else. If it's cheaper to be on welfare, they'll be on welfare. If it's cheaper to, you know, um, figure out some other arrangement, they'll do it. So... I, I think we should have a safety net. I think that we should have welfare. I, I don't think we should uh, think of these things as sort of permanent systems. And I think that's what the Democrats want to take us to. They want to take us to this place where you have a permanent underclass that's on the dole that, yeah, maybe they don't have any skills, but it's okay because you're just sending them money. Um, I, I think it's like really bad even for the people receiving that. So I would be, you know, looking to, um, to make sure our safety net is a net that catches people and it's supposed to bounce them back up get in the workforce, right? But, but you cannot destroy the motivation to work. There's a cultural component too. Like I think for so long, our education system has been broken. We no longer ask anything of our children. We just lower standards every year, get more people graduating. You know, their test scores suck. So there's a huge problem. So let's send more money into the schools. And it just becomes this, this whole horrible system. But I think uh, people through it, just people basically stop believing in themselves. Like, I think there's a huge cultural problem where nobody feels like they have any agency. Nobody feels like um, like they can go and actually make something of themselves unless they were already born on second base. I think that's a huge problem. Uh, it's hard to know exactly how to fix it, but I do think it's a problem. It's like a, the tyranny of low expectations, and it becomes this self-fulfilling feedback loop. And it seems out of, you know, but the old Republican talking point, like, oh, just work hard and make your own luck, and, like, you'll bootstrap yourself, and, like, you know, here's an example of someone who did it. That's also sort of demotivational because people feel like they can't do. It. I think they actually could. I think people are way more powerful and have more individual agency than they think. But, but um, you know, decline is all around us. And they're in. If you're sitting in a in a school that sucks, your teacher, you know, is either teaching you left wing garbage, or if you're lucky, they're not doing that. But they're still failing to teach you the basics. They're failing to sort of inspire you to to go and like learn a skill, learn a trade, like figure out how to how to get the basics together in your own life because you are in charge. Like that's not a message that we teach young people. 
So again, not something you can fix with one piece of legislation, but like I see that cultural decline all around us. And the answer is not just to say, well, our own kids are messed up. Uh, so let's just like import a bunch of hardworking immigrants like that. That feels really wrong. That actually feels like we're really giving up our own people. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, supply and demand is certainly an, a factor. Uh, and the, the supply of labor is certainly affected by the amount of, um, of assistance that they're getting from the federal government. I'm hearing without it being said explicitly that I, I'm assuming that you're an advocate of using the government for very specific industrial policy reasons. Uh, if that is true or not, please let me know. And if it is true, how would you use the government to, to guide the economy? What would you invest in? How would you invest in it? Would you use incentives? Would you use tariffs? What is your plan for getting and this is really tough, right? Because we're talking about a super complex system here where you can't really say we want this specific outcome. You have to just sort of control the parameters in the system. But how would you use the government in terms of industrial policy, tariffs, subsidies, et cetera, to affect the economic outcome that you're seeking? Yeah, I, I look, I want markets to be as free as possible domestically. Like I grew up reading Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman and got into the Austrian school stuff. Like I've been down the rabbit hole on the, the sort of libertarian free market economic stuff. And I think it's um, I think it's directionally right. I think it's powerful. I think markets should be as free as possible domestically. I don't think you can, you know, pick winners and losers. I don't think the federal government should be subsidizing. Like if anything, we subsidize, you know, soybeans and sugar and all this stuff that actually has all these downstream effects that I think people like us sort of see and talk about, but, but mostly get ignored by Congress. So I don't want to pick winners and losers. I don't want to invest in, you know, clean tech companies like Solyndra. Like that's, that's an example of how not to do it. But I do think uh, we should be investing in infrastructure. I just think this $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill is mostly crap. And the problem is we lack state capacity so badly. Our state capacity is diminished so much that it becomes almost farcical to suggest that the government can actually do a big engineering project. Um, you know, like we built the Hoover Dam. I was reading a book to my kids the other night and talking about building the Hoover Dam, um, which I guess at the bottom of the base has 600 feet of concrete. And to get all that concrete that wide and that high, they had to run the machines uh, for two years straight to build that. They like, you know, electrified the site and um, lit it up at night and machines were rolling for two years. It's like a really impressive engineering project. And then like, you know, 80 years later or whatever, our earth moving technology is better. We have computers, like everything is better. We ought to be able to do that way easier. And actually you just couldn't because you imagine the bureaucracy and the union labor and the rules and um, environmental impact studies and, and just the political will to make it happen. Like we can't do that anymore. But I think the mistake is to say, well, the government sucks and it messes up everything it touches. And so laissez-faire, we got to be libertarian about it. We have to reclaim some state capacity to be able to do the basics. Um, you know, the government is in charge of building roads, so it should be really good at that. And I, I feel like we've just let that, let that go. So I want to be, domestically, I want to be disciplined about what the government should do. I want to be humble about what it shouldn't do. But one of the biggest roles to, to play domestically is to just cut away at the regulatory overgrowth, at the bureaucracy, so that people can actually feel like they can build um, it, it, I feel like in, innovation is still being restrained by, 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 by just the system, by everything, by, you know, if, if you look at like trying to innovate in healthcare right now, you know, we sort of have the worst of all worlds. We have a regulated quasi socialized system, um, that still sort of lets the, the profit motive operate. And so like, you know, for profit hospital systems, which are basically cartels at this point operate in this hyper-regulated sphere and you just see this regulatory capture where service quality goes down, prices go up. It's very bad for everybody except the people um, in charge. So I think that's bad and we just have to clear it all the way. The, the one place where I would depart from free trade or from, um, from yeah, free trade and, and sort of laissez-faire is domestically. You mentioned tariffs, I think, or internationally. We need more tariffs. Like we need, if China is dumping steel into the U.S., like I think you maybe it's a challenge for a young senator to go and articulate that and show people and convince them. But I think that is true. And so we have to do it. And then we have to put a tariff on China. Like there's no reason that every country should have sort of like unfettered access to our markets. If we can, if we can trace with specificity how that is hurting the average American. And so I think domestically you want things to be as free and open as possible. 
and internationally, especially for na national security reasons and sort of domestic reasons, you, you just want to watch and see how things are going and respond accordingly. We uh, don't do that. Speaking about innovation in your position, how's the deal flow looking? I mean, are you telling me that you're seeing a dearth of deal flow here? No, it's actually really good because I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of capital and venture capital, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of money out there. Nobody knows what to do with it. So paradoxically, I think when everything else grinds to a halt, right? Peter talks about the world of bits versus atoms. Well, the one place you can still really innovate is bits. And it's like probably a really good time to go start an internet company. It's probably a really bad time to go start a nuclear engineering firm or, you know, <laughs> to, to come up with, with like a sort of nan nanobot anti-cancer therapeutic or something, you know, like the hard tech. And we're still seeing some interesting stuff there, but, but the point is there's a lot of capital. Nobody knows what to do with it. And so in some ways, if you're trying to build like a huge business that scales, it's a great time because you'll get funded and you'll get a chance. But again, I think as important as venture capital is, um, somehow most Americans' daily lives are, are very downstream from that. They're not too bad. So I think VC is like a healthy sector right now. Um, but I mean, you know, my, my, yeah, my, my question on that was specifically about, you know, if you, if anybody in the country was going to be seeing innovation, you know, it would be you at your desk getting deal flows from innovators looking for support. Uh, and it sounds to me, like you said, in some aspects of the economy, that's high. The flow is high and in some it's bad. I talked to JD Vance the other day and he said, maybe not on my show, but uh, in another speech, he said that he very strongly wants to encourage the production of real goods in the United States and discourage the production of data goods in the United States uh, for the purposes of a, a, a sort of a, a holistic uh, response to what's happening. When you build things in the United States, you manufacture them in the United States, you ship them around. These are real people with real jobs and real families in America, whereas the data business, as we've seen, they can house their assets offshore. It disconnects them from being in America and being Americans. Uh, to what extent do you agree with that? And do you think that that is a reasonable uh, endeavor? And if so, how do you do it by just simply clearing regulation uh, and, and not actually uh, being more proactive in maybe subsidies or other proactive uh, industrial policy in the U.S.? Well, I agree with the first part. I think we should be encouraging sort of domestic production of actual stuff. I don't think I'd discourage sort of uh, new internet companies or data companies or anything like that. I mean, I think those can be important. I think they become a problem as discussed when they become so big and so successful that they just, you know, they obviously need to be treated in a different way. Um, but I'm pro internet company. I think people should start more. I think there's a lot of innovation uh, that can still be done if you manage not to just get immediately bought up by Facebook or Google or something. There's still many, many cool internet businesses to, to build, hopefully not based on targeted advertising. Um, but I totally agree that we got to do more domestic production. Like we, we just do, obviously like your country is in some sense really weak and vulnerable if you can't make anything here at home, or if you can't satisfy, you know, your domestic needs, your domestic consumer demands, if you can't produce that for yourself, the definition at the mercy of other countries. And when the whole geopolitical, uh, you know, world sort of works, that works. It looks until it doesn't. And then boom, COVID hits. Or like, what's the next shock going to be? And all of a sudden, you can't make the masks that we thought we needed. We couldn't make antibiotics, you know, couldn't make computer chips. So I think this stuff is really bad. And we got we to gotta onshore. I think one way that is, you know, with sort of protectionist trade policies, it's possible to go overkill. And you got to be sort of wise and intelligent about it. But we need more of that. Uh, youth actually think that clearing out domestic uh, overregulation and then setting up protections to sort of uh, get a level playing field going and, and if anything privilege our own domestic producers I think that goes a long way you know should the government actually invest directly in certain industries maybe but again my concern is um, that's pretty theoretical given the, the current technical competence of the government I don't want to just have some some department of investing can you imagine like a, a cabinet level agency who's in charge of just like deploying capital and now you have a government VC fund. And look, I think I'd run that well, you know, I think JD would run that well. And the problem is like the Lindra all the way down. I, I'd love, love the market to do most of this. I, I don't think the market exists in some vacuum. I think we, as, uh, as, as the government, we the 
right, to set limits. I mean, this market is not worker than tariffs, you know, clear away this, this, this overregulation and get to work people. And I think people will surprise them. Yeah. Well, you know, we're talking over this fancy thing called the internet, which as far as I understand it was uh, created in part through subsidies, through DARPA, through DARPAnet, and so, or ARPANET. So the government had a hand in, in building this. I think that there is an option, uh, uh, there's possibilities for targeted uh, domestic investment that could lead to productive outcomes. It's an interesting thing to ponder. We only have a little bit of time left, so I want to ask a couple more questions I got written down here. What should be the relationship between the federal government and Bitcoin or blockchain in general? Is there a role for it within the United States government? How do you think the Federal Reserve should handle this? What is the future for blockchain and Bitcoin within the context of the United States government and our currency? I like Bitcoin because I feel like it's the first meaningful check on the Fed. And so I think that, you know, I, I'm super pro crypto. I, I own some Bitcoin. I've been into it for a long time. Um, I'm super pro. Like I was a Ron Paul Republican in 2008, right? Like audit the Fed, hard money, and then Bitcoin gets invented. And I mean, I don't think I really got into it until 2011, 2012. Um, wasn't 29 or 2010 when it came out, but um, seems like the hardest money around. And I really like that. There's a way to look at the rapid price appreciation of Bitcoin in the last 18 months. And suggest this is the most honest to have right now. Like maybe it's really pricing in all the inflation that we're only now just starting to see. So I like Bitcoin. Um, people want to say like, oh, it's a threat to the US dollar. And I don't put it like that. I put I say it's a <laughs> it's a threat to the Fed's ability to print infinity US dollars in the future. You know, but like that's not a good system. If I'm honest, it's lasted longer than it could or a lot longer than I thought it could. Um, but now that we have this new fancy, you know, MMT label for it, just print as much money as you want. We owe it to ourselves. It's OK. National debt doesn't matter. Like, I don't believe that. And when everybody starts saying that, I think that's that's dangerous. So I don't know whether that system, you know, just collapses in the next five years, but probably in the next 50. It has to. Um, and something like Bitcoin is very interesting because I do think it can serve as a, as a huge uh, check and an instrument of discipline on the Fed. So I don't think the Fed should regulate it. I know the SEC has been <clears throat> sort of interested in doing this. You know, you saw all the uproar when they inserted that crypto <clears throat> regulation in the uh, in the infrastructure bill. I think basically it's like how many senators out of 100 do you think could like define Bitcoin? Probably like not many three or four would, would pass and some would, you know, half would mumble something. But it's like these people don't understand it. I barely understand it. And I, I like live it. Right. This <laughs> stuff moves so fast. I was talking to the polka dot guys the other day about like what they're doing. Right. And this stuff moves so fast. And now with DeFi. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of innovation here. I think the best thing for the government to do is watch it, quickly be humble and get out of the way. And again, this is another argument for smart, young, competent people to get in office because like we're the ones who actually have a prayer at sort of dealing with with these new technologies and understanding how the government should uh, should interact with them. But I think status quo, the government will uh, bring a hammer down on crypto at some point. It'll have the effect of sort of offshoring all of it. But then the United States just gets left behind. Like you can't actually ban this stuff, which is you know, really interesting. It's sort of its promise. It's why it's unique. Is there a role for blockchain within the United States government itself and the administration of the government and the administration of democracy? Is there is there something that we should be looking at there in the future? That's interesting. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I think our election systems are a mess and, uh, you know, people believe all sorts of things about this stuff. I, I'm sympathetic to even the wildest claims because I may not agree with them myself, but I think our system is like obviously not transparent. Um, you know, anytime where like after an election, and see like a tabulation center in Detroit boarding up the windows while people count votes, like it starts to look a lot more banana republic. And so some people in Silicon Valley say like, oh, just, you know, vote using the blockchain, have this open ledger and you could design some better voting system. Uh, I'm open to that, maybe. I don't know. I don't have a strong view on that, but I think uh, I think there's probably a lot more conventional ways to tighten up the system and sort of restore people's faith in it um, and provide transparency. So very often people, you know, default to, oh, let's put this on the blockchain. And it's like, why specifically do you need this on the blockchain? Why specifically can't it just be a database with a lot of transparency into it? Sometimes it's sort of a solution in search of a problem. 
But I think when you have like a central money printing apparatus like the Fed and you have Bitcoin, which is just a, a hard mathematically governed money, no, that that is a as a real solution to a real problem. Yeah. 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 Uh, MMT, you know, I went to George Mason for economics, so I'm pretty well steeped in the libertarian view on these things. And, uh, you know, to hear, I can hear my head. Inflation is at once and always a monetary phenomenon. And to see all the money getting printed and dumped into the economy and see inflation going up and then knowing that MMT's solution to inflation is to raise taxes. That's the way yep. they just, they just print as much money as you want. And when inflation pops up, you just, you just take more money from the people that does rich. not. Yeah. It, <laughs> right. Well, we know for the first time ever, uh, a majority of Americans did not pay federal income tax in 2020, which means we're already funding this all uh, we're, we're fighting inflation and funding the government all on the backs of a minority uh, in the country, but we're all falling a uh, victim to the monetary inflation and the structural inflation that we're seeing from supply disruptions. Uh, we're seeing it all kind of come together there. There is a monetary and a structural argument to be made for inflation that we're seeing. Yep. And anybody that doesn't admit that or, uh, you know, come to terms with that is just, is in uh, denial. Um, I, 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 my gas tank once in Arizona this year hit a hundred bucks hundred wow. bucks okay. yeah yeah we did, mine we used did, to be in the mid 40s and now it's in the mid 60s yeah i mean well, we, just a year ago right so yeah we did the grand canyon tour uh we did bryce and zion it was a lot of fun beautiful place um last question before we go you were a co-author uh with peter Thiel in zero to one and one of the questions in there that people you ask people and peter asked people is what's one view you hold that most people don't but i want you to answer this question in the context of the new right what is your contrarian position within the context of the new right? What is one thing that you believe that most of us on the right, new right, don't believe that you think we may need to pay attention to? That's really interesting. I'll try not to get myself in too much trouble here. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's a tough question. My stab at it would be something like, I see, I see a lot of, um, I see a lot of darkness and vitriol and I won't say hate, but, and I understand why, like, I think the stakes are really high right now. Um, I think we're losing the country to a radical progressive left. I think unchecked that'll wind up killing a lot of people one way or another in the next 20 years. So I understand the passion, but I see a lot of bitterness, you know, I see a lot of black pill and I just think, um, you know, I don't think it's I don't think it's naive or cucked to say it, but I think most people are like really good people, even Democrats and even leftists. I think everybody's trying to figure it out. And this is not a kumbaya moment, but like I'm traveling the state of Arizona. I'm talking with yeah, Republican activists, but also independents and also Democrats. I'm meeting plenty of people. And when you get off of the keyboard, when you get away from the computer and you actually talk to real people, um, I, I, I think there's, you know, these people are not monsters. They're not, they're not enemies. The ideology, the decentralized sort of left-wing progressivism, that's really bad. That's the enemy. That's what we have to fight. But I do, I, I worry about the, the vitriol. And I think most people are good people. And if we run the right people and the right messengers, I think um, we can bring people to our side. Like, I don't, I, I don't fantasize about the civil war that so many people on the right seem to. Um, I don't necessarily think it's going to come to that and i think we have it's our, it's imperative on us to make sure that it doesn't so that's long-winded that's inarticulate no. but i'm i'm sort of uncomfortable with the black pill stuff i understand it but I, I just think so much of this is structural and ideological and it's not personal and there's still a way forward here so I, that's, I that's sort of why i'm running for office i think that that's a fantastic answer uh the contrary position he's taken versus the new right is that not everybody is a terrible person and I'm, I'm being pithy with that, but no, I think you're right. Uh, actually well said. And, it's, I think and it's I, true. And I think it is a contrarian position and not being black pilled, uh, on it and, and sort of, uh, fetishizing, uh, a Balkanization and, or a civil war, uh, is sort of contrary on the new right, especially some more of the more radical ones sides of it. Uh, and, uh, it's clear for somebody who's running for the Senate, that on the scale of reformer to revolutionary, I'm assuming you're tipping to reformer. And even that in and of itself is a bit of a contrary take. So 
Uh, Understanding, I mean, though, that the, the reforms that we need are going to be very radical. Like, right. the, we, we can't just go play at the margins here. Um, but I don't think giving up and saying, like, the system doesn't exist and just go buy Bitcoin and buy 100 guns, although I'm sympathetic to both those things, that's great. <laughs> like, that's not going fi- to that's not going to fix it. Right. Um, I, I just I don't want to wait till things get so bad that we just have to pick up the pieces in 30 years. I think we can still reverse the ship now. Right. Well, I appreciate that take. Thanks for that uplifting end to our conversation. Blake, where can people find you? What can they do? How can they support you? This is your chance to guide people yes. in the right spot. Well, thank you, Jack. They can go to blakemasters.com and uh, you know read, read about me there, sign up, um, donate if you can. And uh, I'm also on Twitter until they kick me off at BG Masters. <laughs> One of the two of us may face that fate one day. I'm hoping not, though. Fingers crossed. Uh, Blake, thank Fingers you so crossed. much for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, good luck with the campaign. Uh, you certainly have my support, and uh, we'll be paying attention very closely. And uh, for better or worse, I look forward to seeing you in Washington, D.C. pretty soon. <laughs> awesome. Sounds good to me. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, We're out. We'll say goodbye to Blake. Thank you very much. Guys, if you enjoyed that show, please hit like button. Please hit retweet. Please send it out. Please help us get around the algorithm. They don't want to hear what we're talking. They don't want you to hear what we're talking about. You got to share it manually. That really helps. If you're interested in masculinity, brotherhood, and sovereignty, please sign up at the Liminal Order, Liminal Hyphen Order. We put out a new newsletter every Monday at noon and it is the only way that you can join the LO. First Monday of every month, we open up 50 spots. Finally, Jack Brunch Tour is coming to a city near you. Uh, this weekend, we are in New York City on Sunday. Two weeks after that, we are in Tampa. Two weeks after that, we're in Nashville. Check us out at jackbrunch.com or follow us on Twitter at Jack Brunch. Guys, thank you so much for everything. I really appreciate it. Blank you, Blake, thank you once again. And with that, we are out. On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward. Best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. 